Hey everyone, it's Presley at ActOutGames.com here, and today we're going to the Nature and Science Museum to speak with an Egyptologist with some of our Egypt class, because some aren't here right now. So, yeah, I'll see you there. And my job here at the museum isn't about archaeology or Egypt. My job is to take care of all of the modern biology. Um, so I am in charge of all the mammals and all the birds and all the insects and all the spiders and all the seashells, arachnids, and right, all of it, and plants too. Um, but I started out in my studies by, I was going to be an archaeologist. And I never really left that except I didn't pursue a career as an archaeologist because it turns out <clears throat> I was doing archaeology in Southern California and I met a, a number of Native Americans there and I decided I did not want to dig up their grandmas and grandpas, which is actually what we were doing. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to dig up dinosaurs and said I'd do that as well. Um, but that's not archaeology, that's paleontology. Um, I found 27 dinosaurs. There's one of them that I found that's on display in Prehistoric Journey. It's a little tiny dinosaur about this tall and about this long. Is it so, like the This one is Othneliosaurus rex. It's a, a group of five babies that are running away from Stegosaurus and Allosaurus up here. I found that in 1991. But I never stopped doing archaeology, um, studying archaeology. Right now, what I do is, um, you can sit if you would like. Um, uh, it's called experimental archaeology. And we actually recreate um, ancient Egyptian uh, material, objects, using what we know about ancient uh, Egyptian techniques and their tools. We actually made that scroll, which is drawn on papyrus, and that's a copy, an exact copy of one of the scrolls from the 18th dynasty. It's from the, what's called the Book of the Dead, which is, this one is many, many, many panels long. That's only two of the panels, and that shows some really uh, probably the coolest part of the Book of the Dead, where it's called the <coughs> uh, Weighing of the Heart Ceremony. You guys know about that? Um, and it, it, one of the, the main thing about being an ancient Egyptian, the main thing is to be resurrected into what we might call the afterlife or into the next world. That was how all ancient Egyptians organized their society. And everybody had a thought, we'll live on if we do certain things. And one of those things was to be a good person because the way the heart ceremony is, your heart is taken by Anubis and put on a scale. It's weighed against the feather of the goddess whose name is Ma'at. Have you heard of Ma'at? She's the goddess of truth, justice, in the Egyptian way. <laughs> Literally. And if your heart weighed more than that feather, in other words, if you had a lot of cares or if you did not so good things and the scales tipped and your heart weighed more, there was a really pretty, nasty, the devourer, whose name is Anit, and she is part crocodile, her front. Her middle is lion, so she's part lion back half, back third, is hippopotamus. So she's made up of three animals. And she's always hungry. And if, if that scale tips, she snarfs up that heart, and you don't get to go into the afterlife. So be good, is the message. <laughs> be good for goodness sake. Which is not a bad message. It comes down to it. The Tutmans, all the way through Tutankhamun, that was what we call the 18th dynasty. Um, and that was the founding of what we call the New Kingdom. It's the old kingdom that started back about 4,900 years ago and lasted for a few hundred years. And then there was an intermediate period, and there was the middle.
Middle Kingdom and then the New Kingdom. By the time of the 30th dynasty, you guys probably know this woman named Cleopatra. She was in the Ptolemaic dynasty, and that was the last dynasty of ancient Egypt. In ancient Egyptian, it's not Tutmos or Tutmosis. The most part is real, but not the top part. Well, they call this Tut after Thoth, the god, the Ibis god. Sometimes it also um, is depicted as a baboon god. Does anyone know about this god? He's a real important god. He's the god of writing and scribes. Anyway, <laughs> so this is this this um, name is Jehuti Mes Kara. Anyway, what this means is Jehudi Mes is the son of Mes, like the word, the name Moses. Probably familiar with that name. Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that means child, essentially. Okay. So uh, you hear that name in a lot of other uh, ancient Egyptian names. Jehudi Mes is kind of like, well, Ram Ramses is actually Rameses, and that, that symbol right there, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. It's right here, too. That is a pile of hides. And that is the um, hieroglyphic symbol for Chava. So, Jehudi Mes, son of Thoth, son of Jehuti, the god of scribes, um, Kamira appearing like Ra. And this is called a cartouche. Cartouches are where you see some of the names of the pharaohs. A lot of pharaohs have two cartouches. And one is the throne name, one is the birth name, and one is the throne name. So once you're born, you get a name, but then when you get to be the king, you get to be, or pharaoh, you get to have another name. You, there's actually a country that they do that now, where they still have queens and kings. It's a country where they've stopped. There's a little country across the England. Yeah. So, uh, if if Prince Charles should become the king, or if Prince William, his son, becomes the king, they might become that, but they could also take a different. Name. Anyway, so that's one throne name. This is another throne name. I mean, this is the birth name. This is the throne name. And this one is... Ah-Kheper-Ka-Ra. I have to read it. Ah-Kheper-Ka-Ra. And it actually means... What is our Kepler Papa? Um, uh, the soul is um, magnificent like the sun god, essentially. The symbol of Ra is always above uh, any of the others because Ra is another god of ancient Egypt. By this time in ancient Egypt, there were 740 something gods. And there were 750 different hieroglyph signs. There's how many signs do we have in the English alphabet? 26. 26 letters plus a few other things that indicate to us, like punctuation marks. And there weren't there weren't really punctuation marks, but there were other signs besides either a single letter or a group of letters or even a whole word or even determinatives that just meant, oh, this means something else. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> this is the first uh, pharaoh. Uh, in the books, you'll see it's Tatmos the, the first. It's actually the Japanese. Um, uh, 
Okay. Keper is, uh, what is that? Scarab beetle. And you'll see that in a lot of names. What's that? We'll talk about that. Okay. Yes. Uh, that's a copy of the original. The original. That's a copy of the original. Okay. These are actual scarab beetles. They're dead. They're not alive anymore. <laughs> they, you, you see the pin through them? <laughs> okay. Everything is dead. Okay. And, yes? Um, never mind. Okay. These particular scarab beetles are also called dung beetles. And a lot of these were seen by the ancient Egyptians as a, a part of that resurrection that I talked to you guys about. So a dung beetle, there are many species of dung beetles, but one group of dung beetles takes up, you guys know what dung is, right? Okay. Takes some of the dung and rolls it into a ball, and then mom and dad roll that off, dig a hole in the ground, lay an egg in there, and guess what that dung is? Baby food. <laughs> It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it, right? <laughs> anyway, because if they weren't around, we'd be knee-deep in you know what, right? So, but the ancient Egyptians saw that, and they saw the dung beetle rolling the ball, and that, to them, was kind of like the sun's turning from the east to the west. The sun is born in the east, and then when it sets in the west, it goes into the uh, underworld, or afterlife. It dies. So the sun is born every morning and dies every evening. So that's just for life. What happens after <laughs> the egg that's laid in the dung ball? The baby hatches out. It's a grub, a larva. It eats and then it matures and it becomes what, are, what is called a pupa, which is one of the stages. And then it emerges into an adult and comes up up from the ground. And that is seen as resurrection. Yes. Uh, first was a guy named Tutmosis the second. That was the next pharaoh, and then Tutmosis the third. This is Tutmosis the third's cartouche. There are some scarabs with his name on them as well. This is let's see. Here's his birth name. That's Jehudi Mes, and that's an S. That just reminds people that Mes ends with an S. Sometimes they just wrote an extra letter. So there's the, or you could say tut, tutmos, if you wanted to Greekify it. Okay, and his uh, throne name is Men Chepera. That means beloved of um, both Cheper, the god, and Ra, the sun god. I take it those are all real then. Uh, Some of these are real. So, here's the deal. This guy wasn't um, the son of the main queen and Tutmosis the third. This was the main queen of Tutmosis the second. I mean Tutmosis the oh, get them straight. <laughs> Tutmosis the first had a couple of kids. One of those was Tutmosis II. Tutmosis II married this person. She's one of the boss lady pharaohs of all time. Her name? Anybody? Hapshetsut. Hapshetsut. Hapshetsut, and here's her name here. It's a throne name. And she's got uh, Matkara. It's her throne name. So she had a daughter. Um, now, the, she wasn't officially the pharaoh because old Tutmosis II had a son by a different wife. These guys had more than one wife sometimes, and they sometimes married their <coughs> sisters. Um, that was what the pharaohs did. Anyway, she had a daughter whose name was, oh, here's another one. This is three nefers. Nefer means beautiful, but if you see three in a row, it means it's pronounced neferu because it's plural. The 
this is uh, Neferura, a really beautiful sun goddess, basically. Um, and, oh, and this is not a, this is the little scarab amulet, but this is a, what's called a, a ostracon. This is just a piece of either pottery or limestone. This one's pottery, and somebody wrote the cartouche of the princess on that. Okay. And that's a real shard. Uh-huh. It turns out that these, this person ruled Egypt as the regent for Tutmos the third because he became in title pharaoh when he was like five years old and so he couldn't make decisions about running Egypt when he was five and he was okay with that actually until he was in his late 20s or early 30s and she then changed her title from regent to pharaoh okay. <clears throat> the problem was that he was from a second uh, queen so to legitimize himself, he actually, uh, later on, when he was in his 40s and after she died, he caused her name to be uh, rubbed out from a lot of monuments. He actually put his name on a lot of her monuments. The biggest uh, obelisks, you guys know what an obelisk is? It's a big... really <laughs> tall. Tall, sometimes even 80 feet tall, carved out a single block of granite way in southern Egypt. And they would have to float it on a boat all the way up to Karnak, which is by Luxor. And that's like several hundred miles on a boat. And then raise it up. Of course, before they raise it up, they would carve all these names on it. And there's one really interesting one still in Karnak where her name was originally on it and then you can see where his name was put over her. <clears throat> she caused the uh, big obelisks down from southern Egypt to come up. She was, uh, she had lots of boats and was in charge of all sorts of fleets. So she told her, her uh, folks um, to have an expedition down to what is now well, we used to say Ethiopia, I think it's Eritrea. Um, it's the land of Punt. Have you ever heard of that? It's spelled P-U-N-T, so it looks like Punt. We pronounce it Punt just because Punt sounds kind of weird. But it's uh, where Ethiopia is now, or since the change, I think it was Eritrea. And on her temple, she had these um, depictions of these boats carved. Now this is a model of one of the boats. It's got linen sails and uh, linen fiber um, lines, <laughs> ropes, and it would have lots of ropes and including. Ah, uh, well, sailors have been doing that for a long time. These are the steering oars. Uh, people that were running the boats would be. These steering oars only move to make uh, to change the direction, but there are oars, if you can see right here. So when the wind wasn't going, you'd need to uh, paddle. It's not the paddle, it's row. That's it. Okay. So the reason why she had all of these boats go down to Ethiopia was that she there was really cool stuff in Ethiopia. There were these little pieces of sap from a couple of different trees. One was called frankincense, the other was called... Amber? Amber's good, good guess. And they would, if they could get it, myrrh. Okay? You guys heard of amber? Yeah. Frankincense and myrrh? Okay. That actually comes from south of, a little bit south of the Middle East. It is found in the Middle East now because people like Hatshepsut not only got the bags of the stuff, um, they also got some trees in planter boxes. And she took those and had them planted in her temple. So that's, they were introduced into the Middle East. This is really cool. Now, why would they want 
sap, tree sap. Have you ever smelled frankincense or more? Okay. It's actually kind of got a perfumey, uh, pine-like scent. So, ancient Egypt, like today, was a warm place. And the ancient Egyptians paid a lot of attention to their personal hygiene. Um, a lot of people shave their heads. So, and um, you'll see pictures of these guys, but they're, they look like they have hair, but those are actually wigs. And on top of the wigs, they would put a cone of wax that was infused or, or made up of uh, nice smelling balms, including frankincense and myrrh. And then that would melt and melt on you. So if you were an ancient Egyptian, you would have this cone on your head, on your wig on your head, and that would melt down and that would be kind of like your deodorant. <laughs> but there was another thing that was a little, potentially a little odoriferous, smelly, and that was mummies. Okay, have you ever mummified anything? I mummified a hot dog. You mummified a hot dog. And a dead chicken. Chicken. Um, at any point, was it smelly? It really didn't smell as much as I thought it would. Okay. But. Well, it depends on what you do. If you mummify, we. One of our experiments was were to mummify some of the food uh, items that were found in Tutankhamun's tomb. Um, and we actually um, have to publish this. It's a, a really very interesting study on how food was mummified, because no one up to this day knows where the foods that were mummified and placed with the bodies cooked or raw before they were mummified. We have, we think, figured that one out, which is kind of cool. Anyway, well, What's the, answer? <laughs> the answer is some of it was cooked. <laughs> But that's the answer in a lot of science. It's, it works for some things, and then the answers are almost always more complicated than you think. So, uh, they used things like frankincense and myrrh to make this mummy smell better. And believe me, if you have a large <coughs> body, like a human, or a large animal, um, or even a big joint of meat, then you, as it's mummifying, it can send off an odor. I can see how we changed ours out a lot. Okay, bit. what did you use to dry it? Um, a combination of salt and... It was a long time ago, I can't remember. Okay. It was a long time ago. We actually had to make our own natron. Natron is found in uh, Wadi Natrun and a couple of other places outside of El Geb. And that's a naturally occurring salt. It's made up of four different salts. Sodium bicarbonate, sodium carbonate, yeah, um, clover salt. What we did was we got the formula for the good natron from Tut's tomb and made our own. So in my, the back of my house, in my porch in Arvada, we had a natron processing facility. And um, we learned a lot about that. And we actually learned some things that will be handy for dirt archaeologists. That's what I, we call people who actually go and dig. So they're going to there were some things about processing natron that no one wrote about that we learned as well. Anyway, um, so that's why they went, and the, um, uh, other expeditions that uh, Hatshepsut and the other pharaohs led um, got other goods that weren't common in Egypt, things like gold from Nubia and uh, wood. If you build a ship like this, you're building it out of wood particularly cedar wood for the big planks of the boat. And that's not found in Egypt in ancient times or in modern times. It's up the coast in a place called Lebanon, we call it Lebanon now. So they would have to go up to Lebanon and get a whole bunch of things. What did the ancient Egyptians trade? They didn't really have money. And what the ancient Egyptians had was an abundance of emmer wheat were the breadbasket of the Middle East. They, they could produce surplus uh, and use that then as a trade item. So remember, he's the guy who becomes Pharaoh when he was five, and then doesn't really become Pharaoh until after Hatshepsut dies. But he then becomes the military 
the, the one of the chief military strategists and, and most successful pharaohs. He actually is the one that solidified and uh, the founding of the New Kingdom, the 18th Dynasty, and all the pharaohs that came after him in the 18th Dynasty sort of uh, got all of his influence because he had a battle at a place called Megiddo. He went up this far north. That's um, where is that? In modern day Israel. Um, at the time, it was he was battling the Hittites and some other uh, folks from the Middle East. And this place you might know as the it's called Armageddon. Megiddo is the same place. Lots of battles have been fought. The most recent battle that was fought was, I think, during the, one of the wars between Israel and some of the other countries. But that was one of the first battles that was fought, was Megiddo, and Tutmos III won that. So he could, had influence over much of the Middle East, and he also had battles in Nubia, and he expanded the Egyptian empire. And then his kids and grandkids all uh, became very wealthy, and um, let's see, this is and there was Tubos the Fourth, and there was no, there was an Amenhotep. There was two or three Amenhoteps in there, and then there was Amenhotep the Third, and there was this guy named Akhenaten, the heretic king, um, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Akhenaten was. That was one of the most interesting periods of time uh, because he said, we don't need all these gods. All we need is the one god. And that was the Aten, the sun. Um, he built a whole new city called um, Akitaten down in what is now Amarna. Um, and I actually got to do work there, which is really cool. But, um, and now, uh, archaeologists are digging up uh, commoners' graves because so much of ancient Egypt was focused on all these rulers and we didn't know a whole lot about the, the common people and with some of my experiments and some of the, the digging that's being done we're actually filling out the story of ancient Egypt um, and then Akhenaten's son is a guy named Tutankhamun and then after Tutankhamun there weren't any pharaohs in the 18th dynasty and things had shifted around and they began the 19th dynasty with this guy named Ramses. There are places you go to ancient Egypt, you can still see the temples and you can still see the, the pyramids and there's nothing around. There's a lot of tourists that have been to ancient Egypt since for the past 250 years and they would take souvenirs. And we see that in a lot of archaeology is that people would take the, the pounding stones from uh, where they were making the obelisks, so they would take things. Uh, well, I was on, with a group of tourists, and they, they kept on saying, oh, oh, can I put that in my pocket? And we found some beautiful pot charts that had uh, multicolored polychromatic uh, paintings on them. I said, no? <laughs> no? So I have some photos of uh, a couple of things that I found outside of the Great Pyramid, and I just photograph them in my hand, and you know, usually I like to put a scale on there, but um, then I put it right back where I found it. Hopefully it's still there. I can't ever guarantee that, but um, it's, it, what happens if people take things from these sites without recording them, then their, the information is lost. Um, it's kind of selfish when you think about it because um, actually when we do science we like to share information so actually we're required to share people, information with people that's why I gotta write that paper about the, <coughs> the food monies <laughs> People used to take mummies from the sites. And what, do you know what they did with them? They just displayed them in their house. They displayed them in the house, and then there was a period of time when the mummies were taken and used <coughs> ground up. Can you imagine? Here's a mummy. It's a person, right, from 3,000 years ago or more. And they would grind them, and then they would sell that product in little jars as medicine. 
that's not a medicinal. Um, <laughs> and other times I would take them and <clears throat> when a mummy is dried out, it's very dry, but it was also wrapped in linen and then that was covered in resin. And that means it burned well. And so a lot of mummies went into the ancient Egyptian railroad locomotives to haul the sugar cane, which is not great. Um, so we did lose a lot of information that way. And other times, um, spectacular things uh, were just taken from Egypt and then without writing down where it's from. That's, we don't do that in any of our sciences. When we find something, we have to write down where it's from, when we found it, all that information. Without that information, is just a curiosity. It's just a pretty bug or pretty rock. I've, I've heard something like that um, when we went to the Florida. Right. We have a lot of those fossils here at the museum, but we know where they're from and when they're from, and that helps us figure out all of those different <laughs> fluorescent fossils have is what's called a lager stop in a light state of preservation. Those uh, leaves, it isn't just leaves, but it's also insects. But it isn't just insects, they also have spiders. And it isn't just leaves, they also have berries from some of the plants. And the coolest of all is they have flowers. This flower that's preserved in this paper shale that's 30, I believe 38, 32 million years old. Flowers are among the most fragile things that exist in nature. They're, they're, you, you know flowers don't last for very long. They're what we call ephemeral. They're, just, they're there, they're beautiful, they attract the insects or whatever, um, and then they're gone. Can you imagine a flower falling into the, into the lake and then getting covered by a thin layer of ash settling down to the ground and then being preserved? That's cool. That is really cool. So it's also very rare. There's only a few other sites where we see soft parts preserved in, in the fossil record. So in archaeology, we are also always looking for those rare things. But nowadays, you know, people are still looking for that, that last remaining tomb that hasn't been found in the Valley of Kings. There's <coughs> a one tomb of one of the early pharaohs from the uh, dynasty hasn't been found. It was actually uh, Tutmosis' father. No one knows, it's Amenhotep the first. No one knows where that tomb is. Uh, we have some places where we think it is. Um, um, I actually was going, I didn't get to dig, but we got to see the preliminary of the dig when they found, uh, it was 56, I believe it was, it was the, the shaft with a storage room. There was big news about three years ago in ancient Egypt. It wasn't a pharaoh, it was just a storeroom. And a lot of things from Tutankhamun's are stuffed in there, stuff that they couldn't put into his tomb. Pass that around. That's a real arrowhead. But did I dig that up out of the ground? I made that. That's part of my experimental archaeology. Um, so I make stone tools as well as other things. So, but that's a real arrowhead. Now, did somebody 400 years ago put it on an arrow and use it to, to hunt for game? Nope. When I was doing experiments, yes, I did. Um, my very first bow was not the best, but um, and one of my professors said, um, this arrow won't shoot straight, so I took it out in my um, in the backyard in San Diego, and I didn't think I would <coughs> actually be successful, but 
Yes, I got a rabbit. <laughs> and I immediately uh, took it home, skinned it, cooked it. It was awful. Um, because what it was eating was not like domestic rabbits, but acquired taste once again. It's kind of a sagey taste. Um, so in, in my book, if, if you kill something, you probably should be prepared to eat it.